If you'll get your Bibles out and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll be in verse 1. And this message is titled, A Word Out of Season. A Word Out of Season. 2 Timothy 4, 1 says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teachers who will suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. God, we thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you have called us to participate in, in being the, the proclaimers of this message of freedom and truth, Lord. Lord, a message to the poor and to the captive and to the slave and to the addict. Lord, to the, the, the prostitute, to the middle class person sitting in their house, Lord, uh, all alone, Lord. People in Africa, people in America, people in Nigeria and, and, and Iran and every place in this globe, God. Let us be your instruments of grace so that we can proclaim your glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would give me the courage to speak your truth by your spirit. And Lord, that you would be magnified and glorified, Lord. I do pray that, that I would decrease God and that my inability to articulate things or speak would not overshadow the wonderful message that I'm attempting to proclaim. So Lord, use your spirit to empower your word in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So in a room that's filled with some teen challenge guys, many of you called to be men and ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ and pastors and kingdom leaders who are sitting here from many different contexts, pastoring churches, pastoring parachurch ministries, doing the work of the Lord. This is a, a moment in time where I wouldn't presume to tell you something new I don't have new information or, or cutting edge information. Uh, there are, you know, other conferences and, and way better equipped men that can probably advise you in some very important practical things for your church. What I'm here to do is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to refresh and encourage you by the word of God, by the power of the spirit of God, so that you can pick up your sword and go back to your battlefield, not on your own power, like Pastor Gary said, but with the power of God. And we all know that the power of God and the, the, the sword I'm talking about is the word of God. I heard a preacher once say, and I know this isn't a perfect saying, but I've always held it close to my heart. The Bible tells us everything we need to know about everything. It, it tells us how to live and, and who Christ is and how to be saved. But the prayer closet is the place we find the power to do it. As a Christian, a young Christian, many of my, uh, and even as a young minister, many of my prayers were, were centered around God change them and change that and change all of this. But what I learned in the prayer closet more than anything, what changed in the prayer closet wasn't the things around me. It was me. That was what changed. And that's what still changes in the prayer closet. So let me just give a little context. Many, if not most of you, know the context of 2 Timothy. But 2 Timothy is a, a message from a pastor and apostle written to a young pastor in the faith. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. You see these affectionate words ringing out as he writes to Timothy in First and Second Timothy. Yes, there are pastoral qualifications and these sort of commandments that, that Paul is giving Timothy as he's telling Timothy what to do to, to correct the error that was going on in Ephesus. Yes, this is the point of it. But intertwined in that, we see this personal message of one pastor to another uh, being encouraged, being empowered, being thrusted forth. 
And so this is the context. The other overarching context of 2 Timothy is this. Paul is sitting in his very last prison cell. Church history tells us that this was probably the last letter that Paul ever wrote before he would be headed on the Romans road. And so just days or weeks or months later, Paul's life on this earth would end. And we know that Paul is aware of this because at the end of 2 Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, my life is already being poured out like a drink offering. I've ran my race. I fought the good fight. And so this message is very powerful and important. Think about it this way. If you were a pastor who had raised up a son in the faith, and I'm looking at some men that I would consider sons in the faith today, men who are pastors now and ministers. Uh, if, If I had one opportunity, my life was about to be taken from me, and you were someone dear that I'd done ministry with for years, what what would I write to you? What would be the the heart cry? We have to remember, not only is this Paul's writing, but this is the inspired word of the Holy Spirit of God. And so in this context, as as Paul has sent Timothy to Ephesus to take a church that is steeped in immorality, sinful living, false doctrine, he he gives them these orders, you know, all through 1st and 2nd Timothy, he's telling them, when you kick out the false pastors and the false teachers, here's what the other one should look like. And here's the centrality of the gospel message they should preach, right? He's giving them this, these directives, But when it comes to the end and the final part of this letter, the final letter he writes, he says, I command you, I command you to preach the word. Timothy was in the midst of a very hard struggle in the church of Ephesus. He was dealing with false teaching, false teachers, and a culture that was, that was at battle, at war. I think sometimes in America, we, we feel like we're, we're in the end times, which I, I believe that we are, but we just, we feel this pressing like we've never felt before because for us, this is a new season for us. We're not debating the things we debated 20 years ago. We're debating things that are so fundamentally true. Things are so basic. I even remember as a young person growing up who lived the life of debauchery and sin. By the way, I, I, I came to Christ as a drug addict and, and an alcoholic who God radically saved and used the ministry of Teen Challenge to change my life. But I even remember just 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it wasn't that we were debating what was right or what was wrong. We were just doing what was wrong. True North is being taken away. And I hate to say this, but parts of the church have adapted this sort of pseudo intellectual, psychological, uh, you can do harder, try harder. Listen, Christianity is not a self-improvement program. It is not some place to come in and kind of get the, the bad edges off you and sharpen yourself so you can be better. It's, it's, a, it's a religion about people who are dead in sin and trespass being raised to life because of what Christ did on the cross. It's supernatural. And if we don't first and foremost think of the gospel as supernatural, then, then one of two things will happen. We will find a, a false pseudo dependence on God or we'll find a self-deceived dependence on ourselves. And this is what all false doctrine does. It takes the the gaze off of the glory and majesty and the beauty of Christ's atoning work on the cross. And sometimes not even all the way down to something dark, just drops it ever so slightly. Back to men and women chasing their dreams and being their best. I, I want you to achieve things and do things. But I want you to follow the, the model prayer Jesus gave us. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. We need a reformation. We need restoration and we need revival. But a revival of what? I've heard a lot of revival talk in the church for many, many years. And I hear people, they're actually talking about different things. Sometimes people for revival, they want things to go back to how America was in the 1950s. That's, that's what a revival would be for them. For some people, revival would be if their kids would just, you know, uh, listen a little better or if people would stop acting, you know, like sinners in the world. Or listen, rev- this is not what I'm talking about when I talk about revival. Here's what I believe revival is. The bold and fearless proclamation of the full and true gospel of Jesus Christ and the new covenant he has given to us in his word. 
a clear, concise preaching of the full counsel of God's word that is accompanied by fervent prayer of God's people, which we hope, not a formula, not that we are demanding anything, but that we hope and pray will bring an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God, causing men and women to be convicted of their sin and because of this to be drawn to the the repentance and grace that they can only find in the unmerited saving grace of God, confessing Christ as Savior and Lord. And because of this true spiritual regeneration, they live lives of holiness and obedience to God, teaching their children and their families to do the same. And in response to this precious gift that they have been given, they pour out their lives to forward that gospel. This is what revival really looks like. It's not a a momentary thing. It's not a spark. It's not getting excited. It's about seeing God for who he is. And, 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 and being so overtaken by that. Listen, we talk, and I, I like to make this distinction, and I'm so glad that Gary preached his message before mine because it frames some of the things I'm going to say. Listen, I, when I talk about obedience and holiness, I'm not saying this, we're doing this to, to alleviate the shame and pain of our life or because we're, we're trying hard to work hard at being better people. This is the sort of like self-improvement Christianity that is very popular today. And it's popular because the world needs what it's offering, but it doesn't really solve anything. It identifies a problem and it gives them something that is, that is not going to fill them up. It's not going to change them. Here's what true revival looks like. Matthew 13, 44, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that was hidden in a field which a man found and then covered up again. And in his joy goes and sells all he has so that he can buy the field. This is what the true, listen, for me, when I came to to saving faith, true saving faith in Christ, it wasn't a self-improvement project. It was at the end of hopelessness and despair. And people often look at a Teen Challenge guy and they say, well, yeah, of course, because you were a drug addict. But the same gospel that saved me is the same gospel that the upper middle class person living in Edmond needs to hear too. See, the standard we're, 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 we're holding things up to is the standard of a holy God. It's not about trying hard to do better. It's not about making America great again. It's not about, it's not about chasing the things of this world and this flesh. I want America to be great, but I want them to know the greatness of a holy God. I want America to humble themselves like it says in the, in the Old Testament. What does it say in Second Chronicles? I know it's speaking to, to people in the, under the Old Covenant. It's talking to Israel. I understand the context of the scripture, but what does it say? It says, listen, if my people, were called by my name, would work hard at doing better, (laughs) trying hard to do better. If they would just get the right person in office, if they would just, if we could just get some things. No, it says if my people called by my name would humble themselves, humble themselves. Listen, if they'd humble themselves and seek my face, I'd heal their land. I'd hear them from heaven. And see, when I'm praying for revival in this country, I'm not trying to implore a formula. I'm praying that God would hear me from heaven and that we would gather together and God would hear me from heaven. But we have heard God and he spoke and he is speaking and we have access to be the proclaimer of his very word right here. And I I don't mean this in a disrespectful way because there's people that, that are in ministry that really don't know the power of God. There are people who are in ministry that have been weary I mean, life's tough. Sometimes you can forget about the power of God. There's times in my fleshly eyes that I looked out at problems as a team challenge pastor and thought, man, I've, we've sure got to shift this and change this. Me and that man, Lauren Treffler, sit in rooms sometimes trying to figure things out and add things up and do things. And at some point, we just said, we got we to gotta pray. What a fool I was to ever think that I had something to do with what, what needs to happen in this place. And as pastors, brothers, we are foolish to think that if we could just tweak the the, the aesthetic of our church, listen, make beautiful churches, make them excellent. I'm not saying it has to be old-fashioned, 
But if we are under an illusion that by imploring some method of man that we can save the church and draw on this generation, I had a pastor on the phone literally tell me this just a few weeks ago. He said, you don't understand what it's like being a youth pastor today. I, I understand that. I understand what you're saying. But the problem you're dealing with today is the same problem that Paul was dealing with in Ephesus. It was people who loved sin, a culture that had turned their back on God and the message of God. Listen, and here's the question before I get back into this. Do we believe, do we have confidence in the power of God? Any of us who have truly been saved, all we need to do is look at the place where we found Christ or, or more aptly put where he found us. This is what revival looks like, Matthew 13, 44. The purpose of all creation is to bring glory to God. This is why flowers bloom. This is why the sun rises and sets each day. This is why blood courses in and out of our veins and air pumps in and out of our lungs. It's to bring the maximum glory to the sovereign and supreme King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And anything that isn't living in service of that purpose is in rebellion to the sovereignty of God. There may be someone in your church and you think, man, that guy is... He doesn't really know God too well, you know, he's, but he's a pretty good guy. I mean, he's a banker, right? He's, he, he gives the charity, you know, he denies maybe that Christ is the only way to God, but he's a pretty good guy. He's close. And then you look at someone maybe like me who was sitting in your church 20 years ago and you think, man, it's going to take a miracle. Well, we've got to remember in both contexts, it takes a miracle. I like to say this all the time. The, think of your grandma, your aunt, or just like the most, your mom, some of the most precious person you've ever known who didn't curse. Maybe some of your moms did, but, but you just baked pies and said, just the sweetest, nicest person. I always like to say this. That person needed Christ as desperately as the junkie robbing people in the street. And if we keep that centrally focused, then we realize that, that we, what we really need for these people is something we in ourselves can't provide. The seeker-sensitive church growth sort of movement that has infiltrated itself into the church, it doesn't mean I don't want to be seeker-sensitive in and of itself. It doesn't mean I don't want the church to grow. Don't misunderstand me. But these movements have divested much of the church of, of, of real prayer, real purpose, and real power. Let me say it another way. Instead of chasing men and women and trying to fill their wants and needs so that they will fill our pews, we need to be chasing God, seeking God to fulfill his wants and needs. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not going back on what I just said. I'm not saying, hey, try harder to do better. What I'm saying is it's usually about recentering our focus on the surpassing worth of Christ, whose forsake, Paul says, he lost all things and considered them garbage. Acts 3.19 says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom the heaven must receive until the time for the restoring of all things about which God spoke by his mouth to the holy prophets long ago. Now, I've heard many, many people preach the word repent in the way that, that Pastor Gary was talking about. It's almost like this hopeless repentance, right? Repent! But there is, there, repent is not a bad word. Repentance is me, under, listen, to repent is to turn from not just, here's the thing what we think about when we think of sin, not just the junk in our past, in our lives that we, we don't want. Repent is turning from everything, giving all of the things to Christ. This is what happens in the gospel when we come to Christ. But as, as Christians, many, many times, this is about refocusing Sometimes we need to repent, not just that we had some, you know, lustful thought or, or did some grievous sin. Repenting that we put our confidence in, in ourselves rather than in God. Many times that's, that's what we deal with in ministry. As, as the, 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 the rumble of life in ministry rocks us to sleep or discourages us. Preaching the full and true gospel must take three important elements and showcase them. And I say this all the time, 
But when we talk about preaching the full counsel of God or preaching the old covenant and the new covenant, we're not saying that we, we disengage or dis, uh, you, you know, unhitch or whatever they're saying nowadays from the old covenant or the old testament or the law. No, what we need to do is put it in proper perspective. We need to understand it through the eyes of the book of Galatians that the law is a very important part. The law shows us something very, very important, that we are not like God. And there is no hope of us being like God. The book of Romans, if you only read the first few chapters, that book will put you in despair. And it's meant to, because in the true proclamation of the gospel, and like Gary said, why am I proclaiming the gospel to a room full of people that proclaim it every day? Because we need to be reminded of the power of the gospel and the elements of the gospel. Sometimes we focus on one side of it. We just talk about grace or we just talk about the love of God. But those things seem small and tiny to a world that is self-assured and full of self-love and full of, of following themselves and chasing their own dreams. Oh, great. God loves me. Cool. I'll put that in my mind for later. No, what we have to do is we have to preach the law of God in a way that is, that is biblical. We have to talk about the holiness of God, the all-consuming power of God. We need to realize that the same God who flooded the world and killed everybody except for eight people, that God is the same God in the New Testament. And as we raise and magnify the holiness of God and we actually compare ourselves to it, what do we see? Well, we see our, our neediness. We see our insufficiency. Listen, if you're coming to the word of God and looking at God and feeling self-empowered, I'm pretty good. You're not reading it right. And if you're preaching it that way, you're not preaching it right. This is a fundamental element. We used to say, uh, use a term in the church years ago, I don't even know if they said it anymore, but the Romans road. It's this idea of seeing the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and being honest about those two things. And what does it do? It magnifies the grace and the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we actually see who God is and who we are compared to him in our flesh, we come away needy and poor. That's why in Matthew 5, 3, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, mourn their, their sin, mourn, mourn the things that disconnect them from God like they did in the Old Testament. They will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Not, not, the, the, not the strong, not the rich, not the smart, not the innovative. You know who's going to inherit the earth? Those who meekly put their trust in God, and he's going to, to be a partaker as God gives the, the world as a gift to his son, and we will be co-heirs with him in that. Those people will hunger and thirst to be right with God, and God promises they will be filled. Preaching the full and true gospel must be at the centerpiece of all of our preaching. Of Listen, if you don't see Christ in Malachi, if you don't see Christ in Habakkuk, if you don't see Christ in the book of Judges, then you need to go back and, and, and start to understand the gospel better. Because the Old Testament shows us that we needed a better prophet. We needed a better priest. We needed a better sacrifice. We need a king, listen, who will endure one that won't be disqualified based on death because death cannot hold him. Look back with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. So giving context for what Paul says in Timothy 4, he says these words, but understand this, talking to Timothy, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Paul says avoid such people. 
And it's interesting, he didn't say, hey, listen, Ephesus is full of pagans, right? And they're, they're just gritty, ugly sinners, and let's just forget about them. No, he says, listen, there's another group of people. There's going to be an apostate church. There's going to be a place where people have the form of godliness. They have the sanctuary. They got the open Bible, but they're missing something. What are they missing? He says they're missing or denying the power the actual power of it. Preaching the the Old Testament law of God with Christ has no power to save you. It has power to drive you to repentance. Preaching feel-good messages that tell people just chase your dreams and do the best you can. God loves you and he's got you. has no power. The power of Christianity is wrapped up irrevocably and eternally in a blood-stained, jagged cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of Christianity. We haven't outgrown it. We won't outgrow it. We're not going to educate ourselves out of it. We're not going to move past it. The remedy of our fathers and our father's fathers and our father's fathers is the same remedy we need today. It's for all people of all times. If the gospel you're preaching isn't for all people of all times, If what you're preaching every Sunday couldn't be easily preached to someone in Macedonia or someone in in Egypt, obviously there's contextual nuances, but the core of the message is the same. It's good news. It's good news for us here in America. It's good news for them. This was true, what what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 5. It was true in Timothy's time in Ephesus, and it's true today. And please know that I say this humbly, but much of the American church today has a form or appearance of godliness, but denies its power. So my my question for us, where is the power? And I've I've heard it. I've had pastors and friends in ministry call me. Why can't we reach them? I know what it's like to be discouraged. I'm not saying every, because I understand this gospel that every time I've ever preached to a group of people, no, there's been many seasons in time where I had to go home and say, God, am I even doing anything? Is my work even, am I, but here's the thing. In that moment, the answer is no, you're not. Now fix your eyes on Jesus, not just as a believer, but as a preacher of the word, fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith and stand up. And get back out there, just not in your own strength. One of the problems we have today, especially in the American church, is we've let the world influence us. But we can be encouraged as we look in the Bible and realize that we're not the first culture in history to do this. Egypt, or excuse me, Israel was was doing this all through the Old Testament. Paul, most of the New Testament letters were written to recently planted churches that had been drawn back into whatever sort of false doctrine or teaching that was trying to be blended with the church. It's not some new thing. And listen, even as we draw closer to the end, the same power that God had in Ephesus and the same power that God had in Israel and the same power that God had in the Reformation or or in some revival that we look back to 100 or 200 years ago, the same power is today the same as it always has been. But it's not man's power. It's God's power. Christianity is in a religion of mostly good people who are working hard at doing better. It's about being dead in sin and trespass. And through the power of the gospel, being reborn and made alive in Christ, being saved into the eternal family of God. And when you preach that message from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, what you do is you draw the lost person through the power of the Spirit that says God, only God can do it. It draws them to repentance and salvation. And what it does for the true believer who's struggling, it helps them reposition their eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. And as for us, as we're preaching this message, it's the same thing we have to do. We have to be reminded of the power that is sustaining us. And it's the power of the gospel because apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Now, I've I've actually haven't even got to the text yet and and we're getting close to being out of time. So forgive me. Verse one, it says, I charge you in presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in kingdom. So Paul, who's in prison, awaiting to be executed, writes this letter to Timothy 
And what does he say here? What is he giving him? He didn't just say, hey, listen, this is a, something that kind of worked for me when I was in Ephesus. Hey, we, I got some statistics back, and in this region, this, no, what he said was, it was something so, so grandiose, so ominous, so empowering. If you read the text for what it says, it says, I charge you, or the Greek could very easily, same word is also translated some places, I command you. So under the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, Paul says this to Timothy, I command you, I charge you, and not on my own behalf, but on behalf of God the Father, who sustains everything by the power of his being, and by Jesus Christ, his Son, who spoke the world into existence by the power of his word, and who made the gospel come to pass on the cross for you and me. So let there be no like illusion about what we're saying. So everything he's saying is inspired by the spirit of God. But here he buckles down and says, listen, I command you, Timothy. I command you. I charge you. And this command is for all who bear the title of pastor and preacher and anyone who would proclaim this word. Oftentimes men believe they are preaching the word. Well, sometimes when I say preach the word, they go, yeah, preach the word. But, but we have to examine ourselves and ask ourselves this question. Are we preaching our world, our word? Are we preaching the word of worldly wisdom? Are we serving up a meal of that and using the scripture as this garnish that we hope validates our TED Talk Christianity or our self-help messages? The question isn't, are we, are we using scripture? That's not preaching the word. Preaching the word is saying the words of God on his behalf under the power and influence of the spirit of God. And so that's something we have to ask ourselves. I have to ask myself that all the time. There's many times it would have been more convenient to form my message in a way that rallied the people under the sound of my voice inspired them to give or inspired them to take part of community and, and do all these things that I wanted our ministry to do. And those are good things. But how dare I take this word out of context? When you come across those things, preach them in, in the way God tells you to preach all the things, preach the full counsel of God, but be very, very careful not to use God's word as a garnish for your inspired word. Preach the word. We must reverence. We must honor. And we must tremble at the word of God. If we want the, the revival, if we want the, 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 the tender favor of God in our lives, if we want to be known and seen by God, what does he say? He didn't, he didn't say try hard to do better, or clean up your act. No, he says, tremble at my word. Have a contrite spirit. And what this really means is that we see God for who he is. That's all we're really doing is, is really looking at who God is. Man, if I spend a few minutes just glancing through the Psalms <laughs> about who God is, or here in Isaiah 66, 1 and 2, it says, Thus say the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But here's the part I want to focus on. He says, but this is the one on whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. Or how about in Hebrews chapter 11, when it's talking about Noah and it says God spoke that he was going to do something in the earth. And what did it say? It said in him, it produced reverent fear. And what did that produce? It means he actually believed what God was saying. And so for us, oftentimes, you know, we can, man, I've read this thing so many times. I've had people trying to encourage me with scripture and they're like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, I get it. You know, God and Jesus and stuff. Yeah, but I have a real problem I'm dealing with. But when I'll get in this word and I'll get in my prayer closet and I remind myself, I can just remind, all I have to do is think for a few seconds of all that I've seen of God the way he should have dealt with me, but the way he chose to deal with me, the fact that I should be dead or in prison, definitely shouldn't be up here. 
but I'm reminded that it was his grace and love that pulled me from the ditch. And he didn't say sit on the back row of a church somewhere. Some, somehow, some way, he raised up a poor, broken vessel to showcase his glory. Definitely not in the way I look, but it is the fact that he can use anybody to proclaim this glorious gospel. If that don't encourage a well-qualified pastor in her, I don't know what will. Because the same power that empowers a man like me to stand up here and do this. Listen, but it's not about standing up here and doing this. It's about living in the victory of this in your life. He said, preach the word. And when do we do it and how do we do it? He says, well, listen, preach the word. Do it in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, or the NIV says it in a way that's like correct, rebuke, encourage. Now, many of us love to encourage. It's fun to encourage people because it's encouraging. I like to be encouraged. But let me just give you a, a, a little analogy that helps explain this sort of correct rebuke and courage. And let's remember that two-thirds of this statement is in the negative, right? Correct rebuke and then encourage. It would be like if you were a, a t-ball coach for your young son, and your t-ball son is standing up there playing. Listen, if the, if the peg is here and the ball is here and he's going, look at me, Dad. It's not time for encouragement, it's time for careful, loving correction. No, 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 son, listen. Stand here, put your elbow out, put the bat up. Look at the ball, keep your eye on it. He starts forming back, no, 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 rebuke him. No, no, remember your leg goes here. And then once his stance is right, and once his eye is on the ball, and then once he's doing what he's supposed to do, swing, hit or miss, you encourage him. Come on, you can do it. You got it. And listen, we love to encourage people, but many of us don't have the backbone anymore to correct and rebuke. And I'm here to tell you, a church that isn't full of correction and rebuke isn't a church of love because God says he chastises and chastens those he loves because he loves us. God, want, God wrote every bit of this for us, not just to be encouraged, but to be encouraged in him. We can't encourage people in their sin. We can't encourage people in their deception. We can't encourage people as they live half in the world and half in the church. No, we have to give them the truth and love. And like I say very often, the truth is love. So he says, having the form of godliness but denying its power. 1 Corinthians 1.17 says, For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us being saved, it's the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to Jews and it's folly to Gentiles. But to those of us who are both Jew and Greek, it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. Listen, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He's saying this is where the power's at. That may not be what the statistics tell you. That may not be what the latest, greatest methodology tells you. But I'm here to tell you that it's the power of the cross of Christ that brings us to salvation. And listen, that's the message of new covenant that permeates the entirety of the Bible. So I, I, can, I can see Christ in my need for him when I look back into Genesis. And I can thank God that he is a righteous judge when I read the book of Judges and it ends with this. And they did what was wise and right in their own eyes. And when I'm sitting alone, wanting to throw the talon because my eyes have shifted back to me, I realize it was never me who saved me. My works aren't saving me. My pastoral ministry's not saving me. Listen, my preaching's never saved nobody. But the power of God being proclaimed, and I'm just trying to keep my fingerprints off of it, trying to stand back from it. I'm trying just to get God to where he needs to be, glorious, magnified, high and lifted up. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men to myself. Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God that leads men to salvation, first the Jew and then the Greek. It's the power of God, the spirit of God. 
Sometimes in, in, in our circles, we get enamored with the, the spirit of God in a way that is disconnected from the cross of Christ. Listen, you want to see the spirit of God move? Then lift the name of Jesus. Preach the biblical Jesus. That's where God works as his son is proclaimed. And we do this because we live by faith. We can never neither or preach the, to the felt needs of the world. We can't preach that they're going to have their best life now. We can't preach a, surf, a self-serving, self-encouraging message. We can't focus on money all the time because that's what they want to focus. We pre- let's preach on money. Let's preach on giving. Let's do all that stuff. We can't make that the centerpiece of our, of our ministry. We can't make uh, us doing better and not sending the center. Our, the centerpiece of our ministry is that Jesus be lifted up and that all men be drawn to him. And we preach the gospel and the full counsel of God. The time is here in our land, and you don't need me to tell you. The time has come in our land. And I've said this recently, but I I talked to Pastor Carter this time I saw him and last time I saw him, and he said, we're past that time. And it's a sobering thing to think about. We're past the time. But really what the truth is, 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 is we're, we're, we're not only past the time, there never was a time that we could do it in our own flesh. We did have a season of time in this country where it, the, the sinner was large and it was comfortable. There was a blessing on this nation. But the same God, the same God that raised Christ from the dead needs to be proclaimed today. And here's what the, what the difference is, though. Instead of being in season, it's out of season. And we have everybody telling us, listen, that, that's great, but that don't work anymore. You don't know the young people. You don't know the Instagram generation. You don't know the things going on in our school. But it doesn't say to, to preach witty, topical sermons that make people feel good about themselves. It doesn't say to be a person that builds a personal brand about yourself. It doesn't say make all these elements in your church and if you build it, they will come. He says, listen, either it be in season or out of season, preach the word, preach the word. And this is the resounding message that the word of God under the power of God is what transforms lives. And so today in our culture, it is a word out of season. But they need that word. And what we need is is people that have confidence in God, like Paul in prison, writing to the Romans where he says, listen, I'm convinced. What is he convinced of? That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything in creation can separate us from the love, the, the love of God we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Telling people in their sin that God loves you and accepts you is not a good message. That's not a good message. The, the, gospel, the gospel message in John 3 is not that God loves you. It's that God loved you so very much that he took on flesh, lived a perfect life, bled and died, was raised on the third day for you and for me. To effectively preach the word, we must do a couple of things, and verse 5 tells us. So let me just read through the last bit of this. I'm coming to my closing. But it says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and courage with great patience and careful teaching. Why? Because the time's going to come where people don't want sound doctrine anymore. Instead, they will gather to themselves teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. Turn on the TV. They're all over there. Tell you exactly what you want to hear. You want to find a form of Jesus that fits your life? It's there. Our culture will create it for you. There is a Jesus waiting to conform itself to your image instead of us being conformed to his. But Paul says to him, listen, preach the word. I command this of you, preach the word. But also he says to do it this way. Do it sober-mindedly to endure suffering and to do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry, Timothy. So you gotta think about these things. What does it mean to be sober-minded? Sober-minded, or the King James would translate this some places as grave, serious. Listen, as Christians, 
I, I love fellowship and cutting up and having fun and, and, and being, you know, entertainment isn't a bad thing uh, as long as it's not consuming your life. I'm all for these things. But to the preacher, God has called us to preach a message that is so important. So listen, lives and souls hang in the balance. And if we don't feel the weight of that on our shoulders when we take this pulpit, we have no business being up there. I'm not saying that to put a condemnation on you. I'm saying it's, it's something grave. It's something serious. These pe- Listen, there's people in your church. If you go to a church, uh, any church, there's a good chance that there are people in your, your pulpit that are dying and going to hell. Or there are Christians who are in some stage of, of being lost or, or some stage of being uh, struggling or, or just be feeling alone or whatever. And listen, the remedy for that is God's word, the full counsel of God but all centered around the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. So to do this, we must be serious-minded, sober-minded. Listen, I hope the doctor that I go to see has a good bedside manner. I hope that he's friendly and he makes puts me at ease. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is this man is serious-minded, he is well-trained, and he is empowered to do the work he is about to do on my body as he does surgery on me. Give me a doctor who has a bad bedside manner who understands how to fix me rather than someone that has the best bedside manner and has no idea what they're doing in the operating room. Listen, there's nothing wrong with making the waiting rooms of our ministries beautiful and user-friendly and and patient-friendly, but we better make sure as the preacher that we are concentrating on what's happening in that other room. And we need to do it sober-mindedly and seriously because it is a noble task to proclaim the word of God. Number two, endure suffering. I'm here to tell you that that we are in a, a season of time where the true biblical preacher, lest God does a miracle, we are going to endure suffering that the other side of the world has known about for for a long time. And we are just starting to come into But listen, there's never been a time in history where the true proclamation of the gospel wasn't met with with persecution. What does it say? All who want to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. Jesus says, don't worry if they hate you because they hated me too. That doesn't mean we should be hateful. But it is telling us that there will be seasons and, and times when you're proclaiming this word that the church isn't going to be growing and they're not going to be clapping and acclaiming you. Or there's times or some of you that God's going to call to pastor or missions on the other side of the world and nobody's going to be clapping or proclaiming you. And they shouldn't be anyway. You've got to endure suffering. But we don't suffer in vain. We don't mourn like the pagan. We suffer knowing that we have an eternal reward. Listen, I, serving God in this life has given me a better life. But if that changes, if tomorrow world challenge gets shut down by the government and, and they come in and say no more Christian ministries, my confidence in Christ will not be uh, any less than it is today. In fact, it will probably be strengthened because I'll have to depend on him more than I do today. We're going to have to realize that enduring suffering is part of being a Christian and brothers, being a pastor. And it's not just for, for being proclaiming the gospel to a lost and dying world. You're going to endure suffering when you, and you know this already, when you, you sow into someone for a decade and then they do something to hurt you or slander you. I mean, I worked at Teen Challenge. I've had people that are ministers today in the Assembly of God Minister Fellowship that at one day looked at me and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you. <laughs> I'm going to catch you in the street and I'm going to get you. You hear Chance? I'm just, I'm just kidding. There he is. Man of God. Powerful man of God. There are times when... But the reason it feels like suffering and it feels like it feels so hard on us is because we take our eyes off of Christ and put them in the flesh. We need to be immune of the, of the, of the pain and the chaos of persecution, but we also need to be immune from the sound of clapping and the sound of acclaim and the sound when everyone's saying, wow, look at what you're doing now. Because the pers- that person's gonna be like Paul. He's gonna be able to say, listen, I've been up and I've been down. I know both situations. But I found the the, the secret, and it's knowing this. I can endure, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
weary preacher, listen, Jesus said, there will be tribulation, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And then finally, do the work of an evangelist. Listen, there are evangelists. Your husband's an evangelist. Well, there he is. He's an evangelist. That's their whole job is proclaiming the gospel and going around and preaching to people and in that context. But the pastor is also called to do the work of an evangelist because we center everything in God's word off the cross because, not because I say so, but because if you read from the beginning of the New Testament to the end, you see that that's what the New Testament's about. They're not getting past the initial stuff of the cross so they can get onto the more weightier things of Christianity. That is the weight of Christianity. That is the power of Christianity. That is the purpose of Christianity. Jesus came to save sinners. As I finish here, I just want to say it's important for us to do this work in the temple of our heart. You know, it says Jesus came in and he turned the tables over and said, this is a den of robbers. This should be a house of prayer. There's been times in my life where I've had to, to look at myself in the mirror and realize that there's some tables I needed to turn over. Not just grievous sin, but as a minister, trusting in myself, trusting that I'm going to make my budget, trusting that I'm can't call, we can't deliver this message with open hands and open hearts to our people if we're not doing it ourselves. I'm talking about putting our trust in Christ every day. We're not earning our salvation back. We're not resaving ourselves. We're recentering on Christ. The righteous will live by faith, and we must preach the word. And here's my final word and we must pray. I'm not going to say a lot about this because I believe Pastor Carter's probably going to talk about this some, Pastor John maybe, but but listen, Charles Spurgeon once said, someone asked him, what's more important, you know, reading and studying the Bible or prayer? He said, well, what's more important when you breathe, inhaling or exhaling? It's time to pray. It's time for us to gather together under the banner of Christ and seek the face of the Lord. And that's what the whole point of this is, not just to enrich and empower and encourage pastors, but to enrich and empower and encourage pastors to gather together and pray that God would do a work in our land. Lord, I just thank you so much for the work that you have done in all of our lives at the cross, Lord, and the many victories and joys that you've given us in ministry. Lord, I also thank you for the conforming suffering and pain and trial that we've endured that has caused us to depend on you and to refocus on you. But Lord, I pray in this moment, God, that we would recenter on the centrality of the preached word line by line from the pulpits of our churches. And Lord, that we would recenter on the prayer that, that, would, that would cause you, God. Lord, you said you would hear us. You would hear us when we pray, Lord. We don't have to beg. We don't have to cut ourselves. We don't have to run around and chant, God. You hear us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would hear our cry today. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.